I'm so hungry. I can't wait for the food. It's pretty pleasy. Yeah, okay. I have everything here. Just tell me what you want and I'll take it for you. I like to have uh, salmon sashimi, green papaya wait, salad. Wait, 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 hold on. Not so fast. I haven't found it yet. You cannot find it this way. There is a classification system here. There are so many types. I'm getting dizzy. Salmon sashimi is a type of food, so we just look at these. And these are the mains. And we'll look for Japanese style. See? Salmon sashimi. Take this, please. Oh, right. What if I want papaya salad? Then I should look at appetizer. Salad? Oh, yeah, there is. It is actually so much easier if they sort it like this. Are there so many different types of food on this planet? Why is it so complicated? There are more species of life on Earth than this. This is not complicated. Right. There are large and small organisms on this planet. Some are so small that you can't see them with your naked eye, like bacteria. While some are as large as a building. But it's not systematic to sort them by size, so scientists sort them by the similarities in their structure. This method is called classification. Ah, so this allows us to place orders systematically. <laughs> I mean, this allows us to identify and study organisms systematically. Thank you. Ooh, may I ask how animals and plants are classified? Scientists classified animals into two broad categories according to whether they have backbone or not. Those with backbone are called vertebrates. Ooh. The surface of their bodies is wet, and they have four limbs. And us, humans, we are all mammals. Well, these five types of living things that have backbones are called vertebrates. Well, how do we call living things that don't have backbones? Invertebrates? Too easy! So how many types of invertebrates are there? There are a lot. There are more than 1.3 million species of them. They all have different body structures. You finally understand animal classification. Yes, and I have something for you. Blue roses are rare. They have to be dyed. I dyed it myself. The flower absorbs the dye when it absorbs water, and the dye travels along the stem to the petals, resulting in a change of color. The structure that transports water and nutrients in flowers is called vascular tissue. If you cut the stem of a dyed blue rose into thin slices and look at them under a microscope, you see that the vascular tissue that transports water has been dyed blue. Hmm. Plants with vascular tissues are called vascular plants, while those with no vascular tissues, they are called no vascular plants, right? Sensible guess but they're called non-vascular plants. Hmm. With no vascular tissue, how do non-vascular plants transport water and food? Hmm. How do they survive? Non-vascular plants are simpler in structure and smaller in size. They mostly grow in humid and darker places. Oh, I get it now. They are just like moss. Moss is a type of non-vascular plant. It only has simple leaves and stems, but no real roots. They have fake roots for anchoring and for absorbing water and minerals. Most plants that we see in our daily life are vascular plants. Vascular plants can be subdivided into seed plants and non-seed plants. Ooh, tell me more. Fern. Ferns are a type of non-seed vascular plant. Ferns have feather-shaped leaves and their young leaves are rolled up to form fiddleheads. Hmm. 
you can find many spore pockets at the underside of the leaf. Ferns don't have seeds. These pockets burst open when they are mature and the spores inside will be blown everywhere by the wind for reproduction. Non-seed plants use spores to reproduce and these with seed must be the seed plants. But some of them do not have flowers. If they don't have flowers, how do they bear fruit and have seeds? The seeds of some seed plants are found in cones. Their seeds are naked. For example, pine trees, ginkgos, cypresses and cycads. Mm. It means that their seed is not enclosed in the fruit. What are seedless grapes classified as? Seedless fruits are actually flowering plants. Farmers have cultivated sterile fruits that don't have seeds. Mm. That's why I shouldn't think that certain plants are non-seed plants just because I cannot see the seeds. Right. Mosses, ferns, pine trees and ginkgos don't have flowers, so they are called non-flowering plants. Mm. Humans have identified and named around 1.75 million species, but biologists estimate the actual number of creatures may reach 10 million species. Wow, that's a lot! The phenomenon of the variety and variability of life on Earth is called biodiversity. Here is the estimated number of the known living species. Well, since there is a lot of different food in a mall, should we call this the food diversity? Biodiversity builds a complex system of life on Earth. For example, ecosystem diversity means that there are swamps, mudflats, forests and other ecosystems. Oh, so it's like we have Western restaurants, Korean restaurants and hot pot. Then, what is species diversity? Hmm. Species diversities refer to the number of species in a habitat or area. For example, there are different types of food in the restaurant. Do you know anything about genetic diversity then? Genetic diversity refers to the variety present at the level of genes. Mm. It doesn't really matter if we order one or two dishes less in a restaurant. Why is it so important to have biodiversity on Earth? That's because in a restaurant, it won't run out of steaks if it runs out of vegetables. But cows will die of starvation if there is no grass in the habitat. I'll tell you a true story. You see, early in the 19th century, the Americans began to hunt and kill wolves because they believed they were harmful to humans. After several decades, wolves were almost extinct in the country. In Yellowstone National Park of the United States, the population of deer kept increasing because their top predator in the food chain, the wolves, was almost all gone. These deer ate all the trees and grass in the park. The soil was eroded. In the end, the whole ecological environment was destroyed. None of the other creatures could exist. In 1995, the United States government placed 14 wolves in the park. These wolves killed some of the deer. The deer started to avoid places where the wolves would hunt them. The plants at these places started to recover and the bare valleys were slowly covered with trees. When the forest appeared, the birds migrated back rapidly. The population of beavers also increased because they could find food they wanted and have wood to build their dams. These dams then provided otters, muskrats, ducks, fish and reptiles with a space to live. The wolf also killed coyotes, which increased the number of rabbits and mice. More predators like eagles, weasels and foxes which hunted mice were also introduced. The vultures could then eat the rotten meat of the wolves and the berries of the shrubs also attracted bears to Yellowstone National Park. Does it mean that we can increase the biological diversity of an ecosystem by introducing creatures into it? That's not necessarily the case. You can end up destroying the original ecological balance if you move creatures into it randomly. Let me tell you another real example. The apple snail is a species introduced from Taiwan to replace yellow sea snails. 
the merchants finally gave up breeding them for their poor meat quality and then throw them back into the river. The apples now reproduce really quickly because they don't have any natural predators. Their family keep on growing. The apple snails also eat a lot, such as tong choy and sai yung choy. They also ate algae species and discharged droppings that polluted the river and damaged the environment. We still haven't found a way to completely control apple snails. We really shouldn't underestimate the damaging power of these apple snails. Oh yeah, you shouldn't underestimate your power too. You can cause a lot of damages to this world. As long as I'm in the right environment, I can play an important role in it. Check, please. <laughs>